Well, this is the first uh, first episode or first show of this week, and uh, I hope you've been enjoying some of the uh, the addictive story <laughs> that uh, we I've been discussing up to this point. Um, like I said, this is only one way of reaching a bottom. There's many different bottoms. Many addicts get to, you know, their bottom. That's that's how this. That's how we finally get to that place where we, you know, realize that uh, there needs to be a turning point, right? And um, I'm grateful for mine. We're going to pretty much wrap up the mess in this episode, and we might even start in to recovery. And um, I mean, I can't, I cannot express how great recovery is. Uh, best life I've ever lived. Uh, the worst day in recovery is still better than my best day in active addiction. And uh, in active addiction, I mean, should I financially, I made more money in active addiction than I ever did in active recovery. Let me let, let me be quite frank about that. Uh, but I still wouldn't go back, God willing, I still would not go back to active addiction. I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, I've crossed that line, you know, active addiction is just not appealing to me anymore. It's, uh, it's not a place I want to live in. It's not a place I want to be. It's not, uh, it's not the worries that I want in my life today. It's not something that, I mean, we ask guys or people who come into recovery, what are you willing to do in order to become recovered? And, uh, for me, that answer was, anything. I am willing to do anything. I don't, I don't give a fuck what, what I have to do. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to go all the way. I want to change. I have to change. I can't keep doing what I'm doing. So to recap from the last episode, I was off to jail and, uh, this was the second time I basically got pinched and, um, off I went. There was no way I was getting bail. Bail was not happening. I remember laying in the uh, the holding tanks before they process you and throw you into the unit. The guards were basically betting on if I was going to survive my DTs. I was shaking, knocking myself in and out of consciousness because my head was banging off of the goddamn floor. That's exactly what was happening. And they were laughing at me. You know, they were laughing at me. They didn't give a shit if I died or not. They didn't give two fucks about me in that moment, you know. And uh, I thank God that I was in the holding tank by myself. Because had I not been, somebody would have kicked the living shit out of me. You know, I, I there was no way I could have defended myself. There was no way I could have did anything for myself if any physical altercation was about to happen. I mean, I had shit my pants. I had pissed myself. There was no way I was going to be able to de- defend myself. And that's what drinking alcohol and doing drugs does to a person. You know, that's that's the that's the great side effect. I mean, a lot of people in recovery would say, I'm talking about my old war stories. Well, guess what? I think some families, some family members have to understand the depths of what one has to go through in order to recognize where a turning point can be, you know, and this was my depth. This was how far I had to degrade myself or degrade myself to a point where I couldn't continue on with my addictive career. So I remember getting processed in and I finally got into a unit and uh, I was literally looking at jail at that point in time like it was a holiday. I mean, I came to realize that being out on the street and doing what I was doing, I mean, it was fucking hard work. I mean, one of the hardest dr- hardest jobs I've ever had in my life was drug dealing, hands down. And I've had some pretty hard, dr- like, difficult jobs in my lifetime, legitimate and non-legitimate. But, I mean, dealing drugs in the level that I was dealing drugs, I mean, shit, that, it's hard work, you know? A lot of people get paid off. A lot of people uh, are working for you, Um 
it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work, you know. It doesn't you wouldn't think that drug dealers work hard, but believe you me, they work hard. Plus, I mean, add the component of always looking over your shoulder. You know, plus you know, all the bo- other bullshit that I was involved in. I mean, it just it just kept going and going and going and going. And uh jail at that point became a holiday for me. When I finally realized that there was no way I was going to be getting out of jail. That totally uh, felt so, I felt so defeated. You know, there was no way of getting out. I wasn't getting another, I wasn't getting another chance out in, like out into public. You know, they, they locked me up. And uh, I got sent away to a facility that basically, I was remanded, so I wasn't even convicted at this point. But I was f- sent into a facility that was totally surrounded by a brick wall. It was actually uh, made in the, uh, I guess, in the 70s. And it was made for maximum and high medium security. So, like, the maximum penitentiaries have fences around them with barbed wire. The facility I went into was its own microcosm literally i mean it had a brick wall around the whole damn thing you couldn't see anything move or anything happen outside of the facility that you were in i mean you might have been able to see the top of uh, a hotel but you really saw nobody outside the guards moving around and um the guards were uh most of the guards in the facility that i was in were at one time a guard for military prisons in Afghanistan. So these guys were definitely trained on how to do a psych op on you. And uh, it was 100% one of their tactics, you know. I mean, who in the hell ever thought that a holiday would be done in a place where another man could walk up to another man and say, strip down for me. Show me, show me the pink of your brown eye, you know, lift up your tongue. You just touched your ass cheeks and now you're putting your hands in your fucking mouth and you don't have a choice. If you decide not to do that, that guard is going to rip you the fuck down to the ground naked as a jaybird and bring you to a place called solitary confinement. And they can come up with whatever fucking story they want to come up with to put you in there. I mean, the question in that in that moment is not about, is this righteous? Is this right? Is this healthy? Is this clean? It's the motherfucker told you to do it. So guess what? Do it. Do it, son. I own you. Do you get it? I fucking own you. And that's where drugs were bringing me. You know, that's where addiction had brought me in that moment. Here I am in this facility, you know. Uh, I'm in this facility, no drugs, finally starting to clean up. And uh, I I had a psychological break there. You know, some people call it shaking it rough, you know, and uh, for sure I did. I lost my fucking mind in there. You know, I. Uh, the drugs were coming out of me and my mind was starting to come down from all of the cocaine and the methamphetamine and the heroin and the fucking booze and the everything that I was doing, my brain and my brain definitely was starting to recognize and understand what was going on. I had been so sedated for so long, basically since I was, you know, nine, 10, 13 years old until the point that I was 30, 30 some years old, right? I mean, it's crazy. It's just crazy. That happened on uh, August 15th, 2013. Yep, 2013, August 15th. And uh, that's my clean date. That's the day that... uh, I have not had a drink or drug since since that date. And uh, here I am, like I said, back in it, back in uh, in the prison system, in the jail system. And uh, you know the 
a lot of my opponents, so to say, or the other team was in was in that facility as well. And when they were in that facility, I tell you what, they didn't do anything to help me with my mental capacity. I mean, they were pushing me to a point. I mean, these guys were telling me how to commit suicide and, you know, they they're trying to hurt me in many, many ways. And uh it was it was just crazy, you know. It was just crazy how how this was developing. What I definitely did come to terms with in jail was that uh, my mind has fucked up. I am a fucked up person. I to- I totally recognize that. I mean, I realized that my thinking, my thinking is not normal. You know, the way that I think that I'm this facade and this personification and I can be anything I wanted to be. See, this, this was the thing, right? We tell our kids or as being a kid, our parents tell us that we can be anything we want to be, but you know what they didn't tell us really, or what the addict mind goes to, or what my mind goes to, is that becoming something means I have to make it a per- personification. It's not really who I am. See, what I came to realize in jail is who I am can do anything. I don't have to be something, I am already something. I just have to go and do what I have to go and do. Whatever I want to do is what I can go and do. I don't need money. I don't need anything to perpetuate me doing something except for my own motivation. That is what can get me to places. That is what can get me to do things. I mean, fuck, it was my motivation that made all this money selling drugs. It was my motivation that put me in places with people who, I mean... If you think that drugs doesn't make any money, drugs makes a hell of a lot of money. And that's only a front. That's only a front. Really what makes money is a thing called extortion. Really what makes money is pimping. You know why pimping makes money? Because everybody likes pussy. Everybody likes dick. It's just the way it is. If you're gay, then you like other gay men. And sometimes it's easier to pay for it than it is to go and find a date at the bar. And if you like women, well, shit, there you go, right? And sometimes it's just easier to call up your local pimp to get some girl to come out and see you and, you know, give you company for an hour or two and uh, send her on her way. I mean, the big illusion is that drugs is what's perpetuating. It's not It's not the reality, man. I mean, fuck, prostitution's been around forever. Extortion has been around forever. These things have been around forever. Drugs just didn't make it any better, you know? Drugs drugs didn't make it worse, you know? That's, that's not what happened. It's not what happened. And it's not what's happening out there today. It's just not. So, like I said, when I was in jail, I realized that there are some serious mental deficiencies that I have, and I decided I needed to talk to a psychiatrist. And uh, a psychiatrist was a bunch of bullshit, did nothing for me. But the psychologist did quite a bit for me. And the reason why the psychologist did quite a bit for me is because they really look at behavioralism and your behaviors. I mean, I could identify I was a drug addict, 100%. Hands down, I am a drug addict. At that time, I could say it and I could say it out loud and know it was true. What I couldn't say to you was that I was an alcoholic. Why couldn't I say I was an alcoholic? Because my mom had told me set stories about my alcoholic father. Well, my dad is not an alcoholic. What my dad is, is my dad's drunk. He fucking drinks. Alcoholics go to meetings. And alcoholics try to live to the best of their abilities. They try to live within a program called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous or the Program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, when I was in jail... One of the things that had happened is uh, somebody had perpetuated a rumor that I was a, uh, I was a pedophile. Now, this was not true, 100% not true. I mean, none of my charges have ever been of that nature, and I have never committed a crime along that nature. But when he did this, I mean, the reason why he was doing this was because he just didn't like me. And this is what people do when they're sitting in idle time. They try to play jail like it's fucking survivor or some bullshit you know they just don't let people do their time 
right? They want to be a, a part of it. Well, the problem is when you're in a remand center, I mean, it's the access to your information, which is like the access to your charges, so on and so forth. It's very difficult to get. And they call it your paperwork, right? Well, anyways, somebody put in a sheet to uh, somebody put a, uh, basically a report to one of the guards saying that they were going to kill me in jail. And, uh, you know, they shut down the jail and uh, like my unit, they called me out of my my uh, cell and they said, look, at, there's a death threat on you. They're going to kill you. And uh, I said, what for? And they, he said, we don't know. And he said, uh, do you, you don't gamble. Like, we don't never see you at the card table. Like, you don't owe anybody money. I was like, nope. And he said, you're not doing any drugs, right? I said, no, I'll piss for you right now. I will definitely pee clean. And then the guard told me, he said, you know, is it your charges? We looked at your charges. Like, there's nothing in your charges that say anything. And I said, no. And he said, do you want to leave the unit? I said, fuck no. Because if I leave the unit, what's going to end up happening is no no matter what, people are going to believe this rumor. Fuck that, right? I'm not going to protective custody. I'm just not. So they made me sign a waiver for my life. I remember when I signed that waiver for my life, the feeling in my belly was, what the fuck am I doing with these people? What am I doing with these fucking people? The, like... This is crazy. I mean, I know what animals are, man. I mean, gangsters are animals. Believe me, I, I, I was I hung around the best of them, you know, but these fucking idiots in jail are just retarded. I mean, with gangsters, real gangsters, we played chess with each other and we played chess with other people. But you could get shot. You could get killed on the street. Sure. Bad drug deal, whatever. Things can happen. But to create some bullshit that could dishonor you is something we would never do on the street. We would never fucking do something like that. But these momos in a fucking joint, this is the kind of bullshit that my addiction put me in front of. That's what happened. The other thing that I came to when I was in jail was I didn't want or need any drugs. I mean, one of the things that I came to realize was when my addiction calls, I answer. And what was happening in jail was my addiction wasn't calling. God or odd, call it whatever you want. But I guess the environment in there and the way that the structure is, I mean, I, there's guys who get high in jail. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's drugs in there. I just didn't want for nothing. And as well, I had no means of making money because one of the things I had did at this time when my lawyer couldn't get me out, who is hired by the organization that I was involved with, I fired the lawyer. Why did I fire the lawyer? I fired the lawyer because the organization I was involved with left me high and dry while I was in there. They left me, you know, they were... Uh, always around me and always willing to help me when I was out on the street, helping them make money. But all of a sudden, now that I'm in peril, they're not so quick to answer their phone anymore when I come when I call. I mean, a lot of that was due to me. I mean, I was, I was always fucking things up. I mean, that's, that's the nature of an addict. That's, that's what I, that's what I do when I'm using and, and, and drinking, womanizing and all the things that I was doing. So, Basically, I shut I shut the communication down between me and them, and that basically forced me out of the family, so to say. And uh, once I was out of the family, I was a lone ranger, and all this bullshit is happening about this guy calling me a pedophile, and there's a fucking hit on me, and, and all this stuff, and none of it was true. And uh, I did not check off, as they say. I stayed on the unit. And uh, guys got in my face. Nobody really hit me. Nobody really did anything to me. And I wouldn't leave. So none of it's true. I said, if it was true, the guards would have told you fucks that I was a pedophile so that you guys could fucking do me in. Like, that's what would have happened. You don't just all of a sudden imagine that some fucking guy is a pedophile. It just doesn't happen. Consider your source. You know, your source is full of shit. That's what it boiled down to. And uh, my actions spoke that as much as my words did. So as time went on, I realized that nobody was my friend and I became a lone soldier. And uh, I, I, uh, I uh, 
stopped talking to a lot of people while I was in there. And what I did start doing was I started journaling and writing. And uh, that's a bad move too in jail for most people because when you do that kind of stuff, people think that you're taking notes, you know, and you're going to rat them out and all this stuff, right? And um, I just knew even from my childhood that journaling was good. This was a good thing for me. It was a good outlet. And um, I kept on persisting with that journaling. And in fact, even today, I still journal today. And uh, so here, here I am in this cell. Um, there's a couple guys who I did get along with. And we were all really fighting addiction. I think one of the things too, like even in active addiction, when I ran out of money, I was okay without using for, for a time being, you know. And then all of a sudden, I had to put myself in a position where I had money all the time so that I could always use. And hence why I broke bad and did what I did. Now that I'm in jail, I mean, the biggest proponent of being in jail, especially on a remand, is you don't know when you're getting out. You just, you don't know. I mean, you're waiting for a fucking trial. That's what you're waiting for. And uh, like I said, I was talking to the psychologist at this time and making some serious gains mentally. And then it was offered to me, would you like to go into a three-week addiction course? And I said, sure, you know. So there was maybe three or four of us in that in that addictions course that, that really wanted to be there. And when we really wanted to be there, I mean, we really wanted to be there. Most of the people that were in that room just wanted to be there because it got them out off of the unit and out of their cell. But there was a couple of us that really wanted to be there. And uh, I met a guy named Paul. And uh, Paul and I at times were in the depths and grips of fucking hell. Literal hell. I did know him a little bit from the street. And, uh, you know, he was in a different unit than I was. And he was also unit... Uh, confined, which meant that he would have either gotten to a fight at the, in the cafeteria or somebody was going to fight him, whatever it was. He was unit confined and on a sentenced unit. And I was in a remand unit. And uh, so here we were. And it was really cool seeing him. He was one of the guys, you know, that really wanted to change. And uh, him and I became best of friends. And then what I, he ended up not finishing the addictions course due to getting pulled into the political bullshit that happens in jail. And uh, I, I did finish that program. I learned a hell of a lot. You know, I, I understood my chemical deformity, my chemical dependency. Me as an addict, you know, in simplistic terms, I do not digest drugs and alcohol normally i do not consume it normally my body does not know how to break it down like a normal person when i drink i can drink 20 beers get up off the table and i'm on the ground pissing my pants drunk but a normal person when they consume alcohol they metabolize every drink as they're drinking it however for me i metabolize it when i move Therefore, you ever hear the saying, I have a beer leg? Well, that's where that saying comes from. You know, I don't I don't feel the effects of alcohol until I actually move until my body is doing something. And when I'm sitting there drinking, I only feel a small fraction of what that chemical is doing in my body. And because I only feel that small fraction, my brain keeps telling me shit, we can do more. Let's do more. And then all of a sudden, when I get to that point where I feel so intoxicated, I go, shit, cocaine will make me sober again. I mean, cocaine st stopped my alcoholism flat out, right? Like flat out. So I started using drugs in order to combat other drugs in order to get through life. I mean, that's, that's what I was doing when I was out there. And I started recognizing this when I was in that addictions course, right? And then the next thing that happened, I, this poor chaplain, this poor chaplain, I used to tell her at least once a week how the Bible was wrong. See, in the the facility that I was in, the governing body, Alberta Health Services, for any of the addiction piece, had not um, 
they had not approved that the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or the basic text from Narcotics Anonymous was acceptable to be giving to addicts when we were in jail. So we, we weren't allowed to read it. I mean, we, we had no exposure to it, which was it's horrible. I mean, it's just horrible. So when that was all going, like, as I was going through this addiction counseling, like I said, I was talking to this chaplain and I am baptized Catholic. I mean, I, I am, I'm French Catholic, right? Like shit, I was baptized almost out of the womb. And, uh, so like I said, I would sit down and I would tell her what was wrong with the Bible and how it was all bullshit and none of it was real. And, you know, Jesus Christ was a fictional character and all this stuff. Right. And she would just sit there and let me go on and on and on. And um, I remember I was sitting in my cell during a lockup time and I was reflecting about my childhood and having no dad. And this aha moment kind of happened where I realized this was actually a blessing, you know, and the blessing was this. There is one father that you can claim if you decide, and he is far more superior than your own biological father. Your biological father left you alone and God would be willing to adopt you. And uh, for me, that was a pr very, very profound experience because I realized in that God, there's no fault. In that God, he's perfect, right? I mean, you and I may never, ever agree on the qualities of God or what God looks like in the sense of his qualities. But the one thing that we must always agree upon is that God is perfect. He's perfect for you and he's perfect for me. And he's perfect in the way that he needs to be perfect for you or for me. That's just what God is. Because if God was human, he'd shit the bed every fucking day, all day long. God cannot be a building because man can tear down a building. Can God be a river? 100% God could be a river. Try to stop it. You can't stop it. You can't stop You can damn it. But even by damming it, the water still wants to tr trickle, th trickle through and it's going to flood if you don't allow some of it to come through. That's just the force. That is the force, right? It's bigger than you. You can't stop it. And it's perfect for being perfect for you. It provides you perfect nutrients. Water is something you need. You have to have it. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what I realized in that moment. The God, God is willing to adopt me. He'll adopt me, you know, and uh, I took that on. And then all of a sudden I took that on. And uh, as I took that on, I started reading this thing called the word among us. And I also started talking to people about the Bible. And you know, I jumped in he heels first, you know, like addicts do. I just Geronimo jumped off of that, off of that, uh, off of that cliff and there I was now talking about God all of the time to people I almost I became a fanatic you know and um, some people were open to it and some people weren't what I did realize there was this one instance where I was asked to stand up and and talk about the word among us and the meditation for that day and all this stuff. And this, this, I had been doing it here and there with like maybe four or five guys and, you know, maybe six or seven guys. This was quite some time after the whole pedophile scandal. And, uh, so <laughs> in the, in the, in the unit that I was in, there was 80 men in there in total. And, uh, so, you know, the word went around that I was going to, you know, basically get up and read the Bible. And you have to remember, a lot of guys in jail can't read, you know. And so anyways, I got up on this, basically what ended up happening on the tier in the unit, which is like a balcony, I guess. All of the guys in this unit started corralling. And the guards' faces, they were ready to call a fucking riot. 
you know they were getting really really scared you could see the tone of the guards they were nervous like they were ready to run out the fucking door right and then i got up on a chair started reading the bible and all these people really enjoyed it you know they really enjoyed what was happening what was going on and and so on and so forth I was experiencing something very similar to sobriety, but really what I was experiencing was a thing called abstinence. I just wasn't drinking and using. That's what was happening when I was when I was in in incarcerated. I ended up getting a new lawyer and I got a new lawyer through legal aid and he he was good. He actually came from a really good firm. I mean, he was really good at what he did. And uh we started talking about potentially uh, getting out, getting bail. I mean, I had been sitting in jail at this point by, uh, I think it was seven months. Yeah, about seven months in remand. And I, I had, like I said, I have no idea when I'm getting out. I'm, I'm waiting for a trial that was booked two years later. <laughs> right? They're not doing anything fast for me. And so, uh, which essentially could have put me in that remand for three years. You know, that's that's how long I would have been waiting for the trial. And so what ended up happening was, uh, you know, I started talking to my lawyer and I said, you know, I've, I'm working with a psychologist. I'm working with the addictions, the addictions part of the jail. And I'm also, you know, going to apply for rehab. This is why I need to get out of jail is I, I want to go to treatment. I have to go to treatment. This place isn't doing anything for me. And there's a lot of trauma in my life that I have to get out like I, I i want to be clean and sober that's what i said to the lawyer and so i also started working with a group called the corrections transitions team which basically their mandate is to help people into treatment or into the facility that would be the best transition for their mental health after they leave incarceration and so what ended up happening was uh, that same chaplain who i used to go in and tell all the time <laughs> that God was wrong. She was profoundly moved at my spiritual upheaval, so to say. And uh, one of these instances, she came into the unit to see exactly what was going on with this meditation that I was doing once a day in the afternoons because the guards were talking about it. They were totally blown away. And one of the, the unit that I was in was a very highly violent, very volatile unit. And it seemed to be that when this meditation was happening and us talking in an open forum of what what the word among us was telling us through the Bible, so on and so forth, it was very positive in its effects towards all of the men that were sitting around that table. And so I was praying quite a bit. I, uh, I learned how to pray the rosary and I learned how to do all of these things to keep my mind kind of in a positive way. And uh, I remember it was about the same time that this chaplain came in and saw all this stuff. Like I said, she was profoundly moved from it. And, and at the same time, my lawyer was going for bail. So one thing to, to recognize here is, is in the Canadian system, when you lose bail at the justice of the peace level, which is the bottom end court, you have to wait 30 days in jail or 14 days to 30 days in jail in order to reapply for provincial bail. And then once you apply for a provincial bail, if they deny you, then you have to go to what's called a QBAC or Queen's Bench Court in order to get a bail hearing. And so prevent the province had denied me many, many times, and I had to go to a QBAC court in order to get um, in order to get bail. The judge who actually denied me from provincial and my first time in QBAC was probably one of the easiest judges to ever get a bail out of. And um, she wasn't giving me bail. <laughs> that, that was not going to happen you know, in, in her mind. So my lawyer prepared all of his paperwork. I had talked to tra corrections transitions team. They were ready, even willing to go into court and advocate on my behalf of a profound change that had happened to me. And they really believed that I would not be a part of the 93% recidivist statistical, uh, 
statistical recidivism that that we are faced with in the Canadian system. And uh, they also suggested that I had good support set up in order to be able to uh, to to positively change my life upon release from incarceration and endure the rest of my wait for trial while being in the in in society in the community essentially what they're trying to say was that i was no longer a threat to the community you know i wasn't going to hurt anybody I, I he's changed basically and so uh i remember going through this with my with my lawyer and uh there was one of these times where i was just my head was spinning like you can't imagine what that's like in jail when or maybe you can maybe you've been in jail and you know exactly what this is pacing your cell thinking about oh what if i get out what if i don't get out what happens if i don't get out if i don't get out it's going to be another like three or four months i might as well just go to trial and plead out go to the pen do my time and get the fuck out of here let's get this thing going you know let's let's just do this let's 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 fucking get it going right and um I remember thinking that and I was so stressed out. I couldn't even, and it was, this was during a lockup time. I couldn't even listen to the radio. So I shut the radio off and the, the channel that I was listening to was a talk radio, like a CBC talk radio channel. And, uh, I just kept telling, I just kept saying, God, do you exist? Just give me a sign that things are going to be okay. I'm tired of worrying. I'm always worrying. Just let me not be so worried. And uh, I turned on the radio, and when I turned on the radio, I guess the CBC had been doing a feature on Bob Marley. But as I turned on that radio, on the radio, what came over the radio was the song Everything's Gonna Be Alright by Bob Marley. And uh, I felt loved. I felt like... God wasn't going to give up on me. The father that adopted me was going to take me all the way now. Call it God or odd or whatever you want to call it. It was the feeling that meant th something to me. It was the realization that things can happen and things are, can change. You know, you're spawning something good. And it's damn difficult to spawn positivity out of such a negative hole like jail. Just, it's, de it's damn difficult. And uh, I felt okay then. I really felt okay. And I really believed in that. And so, um, because also, because the chaplain at the same time that this is all happening had seen this huge crazy thing with these guys in in uh in that uh meditation piece she decided to give us a, a thing called holy tuesday see because we couldn't have holy thursday and holy thursday because of the way how the jail is so we had a holy tuesday um and in the catholic faith we have holy thursday right before good friday and then of course the easter celebration over easter the easter weekend so my lawyer went to bail um, prior to this Holy Tuesday thing, about two weeks prior to it. And uh, I called my lawyer the day that I'm supposed to, he went to bail. I was actually supposed to be in court and I ended up not being on the list to go to court. So I thought that was kind of strange. Anyways, I called him at the end of the day and uh, I said, I said to my lawyer, I said, do we have good news? And he says to me, he goes, Justin, I don't know if God exists. But he said, whatever happened today in that courtroom, there was no way you were staying in jail. There was no way. I said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm getting free. He goes, oh, yeah, you've got bail. And uh, I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, this is what happened. The judge that we wanted came in and she said, look it, I can't preside. Sorry, the judge that we wanted was unable to show up because they were sick. The other judge came in 
who is probably a good judge to pitch in front of, sat down and said, I cannot sit in this bail hearing because I've already ruled against his bail. I can't contradict myself. So she went, she and she left. Then we got another judge to sit and he was a no judge. Nine times out of 10, what this judge says is bail denied. Let's move on. And he goes to the golf course and it starts teeing off. I mean, that's, that's what he does. So nine times out of 10, this guy says no. And the only time that he says yes is first time offenders. Well, at this point, I'm not a first time offender. So he had me there and, uh, well, what ended up happening was he gave me a yes. Now, what you have to understand is I shit the bed on a bail with a significant amount of money and I no longer have the family behind me, which is the organization I was involved in, in order to pay my bail. And I no longer have a, have my fa my family cannot come up with this money. Like my, my mom herself cannot come up. She doesn't have the, the money to bail me out. And I don't know anybody in Alberta at that time, like who could get me out. So here I am completely ecstatic. And now I have to figure out how in the hell am I going to get out of jail um, without any money? And so I sat for about two weeks and that's hell, you know? Now, I'm also going to say this, the guy <laughs> who went and perpetuated this rumor about me being a pedophile. So, so my bail, my second bail was set at $2,200 and I had no hope in hell of getting that money. I didn't know where that money was at all. And, uh, so the guy who perpetuated that rumor, he had a $500 bail and he could not come up with the money. They even reduced his bail to $200, which means they want him out of jail and he could not come up with that money. So that guy lived in that hell of trying to get out with that very low amount of money to get out of jail for, I think it was almost five months. And uh, like I said, I went to, I went to, I was going on this path for two weeks of, trying to see who I could rummage up to get the money in order to bail me out. And there was nobody like, I mean, there was nobody really coming to my aid in order to bail me out. And so all of a sudden this Holy Tuesday thing happened and uh, I just kind of left it with my higher power. And uh, Holy Tuesday happened, we went to the chapel, our feet were washed and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, we had great, juice and and bread and and it was a good time i got back to my unit and the guard says hey justin pack your shit you're out what the fuck right blow my mind away so i had to go down to r d which is reception and uh sign my bail papers with the jp on the phone so i went down there and uh, I'm standing in the holding tank and I'm pacing and I'm pacing and I'm pacing. The guard said, ah, I'll probably call in about 10, 15 minutes. Well, 10, 15 minutes passes and there's no guard that calls. So I pull out my rosary and I start praying my rosary in the holding tank, trying to keep my mind preoccupied from the what ifs and where am I going to go and all this, all this stuff. And uh, as soon as I was done praying that rosary, I mean, as soon as I was done praying that rosary, again, call it God or odd or whatever you want to call it, but the phone rang. And when the phone rang, that was the JP telling me I had to sign my papers. So, I signed my papers. Then they called the people who were supposed to come pick me up. Well, the people who were supposed to come pick me up were solid, drunk, and stoned, and they lived way the hell out in the country. I mean, my bail conditions were so tight that when I left the jail, there was a designed... Um, path or route that the people who were coming to pick me up had to drive back to their house. And I assure you that the police definitely checked all the way through. I mean, my conditions were crazy. They're just crazy. And so as this was happening, uh, like I said, I called them to come pick me up and they were intoxicated. There was no way they could pick me up. I looked at the guard and I said, I've got nowhere to go right now. You know, and it was like 10 o'clock or so that night. And they said that they could come pick me up tomorrow morning, but there was no way they could pick me up that night. Typically, the, ju the, the jail has to kick you out in case anything happens to you. They have no choice. So the guard made a decision call and he just said, well, I guess we'll keep you one more night. Pack your shit and make sure you're ready to go for this thing in the morning. So I went back to the unit 
packed my shit and uh, I hung out. And when I hung out in the cell, I couldn't sleep. I mean, I was getting out. But I was actually afraid to leave that cell. I felt the same feeling that I felt when I was leaving that demonstration school in southern Ontario. That's what I felt. I was afraid. I was afraid to be in society. I was afraid I was going to use again. I realized in that moment that I'm not fixed. I'm not cured. These people came and picked me up the next morning. And uh, we went down to their house, and um, that was hell. I didn't know how to live without booze and alcohol. I mean, I was abstinent. I wasn't really recovered. I was not in sobriety. I did not know how to live in a sober way. I mean, that addictions course for three weeks was great in giving me self-knowledge, but it was not great in telling me what a solution was for my addiction. There was no solution. And I was sitting there so afraid. I was afraid of everything. I remember going to the probation officer going, what the hell happens if I shit the bed on this? And the probation officer looked at me and goes, well, you're going back to jail. So Corrections Transitions team was kind of a lifeline for me. Actually, not even kind of. They were a total lifeline for me. They got me signed up for a treatment center. And they got me some cash through the social assistance program that we have here in Canada. And I had to sit for 30 days. Because here in Canada, the way how our healthcare system is, is it's not door to door. It's not fast at all. You're on a waiting list for everything. And in my opinion, addiction is the same thing with like cancer. Once you have it, you have it. Once you're ready to get treatment, you have to get treatment. The longer you sit and wait, the more likely it is that you're going to die. It's a de- life or death disease. Okay, That's what addiction is. It's a life or death disease. And I felt like my time was slipping through the hourglass. I mean, I was maintaining. I didn't know anything about meetings. I didn't know anything about anything. All I knew is I was pulling out the hair out of my head and I was ripping out the nails in my hands. And I was trying to beat my head against the wall so that I wouldn't use. That's what I knew. All day long for 30 days is what was happening. I was freaking out. I was freaking out. Finally, the 30 days passes and I got to treatment. I did another 30 days in treatment, sorry, 19 days in treatment. And you know who showed up to my graduation? Nobody. Nobody. I left that treatment center after nine months in jail. And uh, as I was walking out, the counselor from Corrections Transitions Team was at the door because she was dropping off somebody else and uh, I guess she kind of showed up to my graduation I also realized that I had nowhere to go after after treatment and I got I was very fortunate to get into a three-quarter halfway house afterwards I went to a three-quarter slash halfway house some of the some of the uh, require well the requirements to stay in that house was I had to have a sponsor I had to be going to meetings and I had to be working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or whatever the hell you wanna want wanna call uh, the A that will save your A and um, I remember in treatment they kept telling me what is that you need aftercare but they would never really tell us what aftercare was and a lot of that is due to the scruples of the system because they won't they're not counselors themselves are not allowed to endorse any a program but that's basically what they're talking about is an a program and so there i was trying to figure out this whole bloody thing of what is what do i do now so like i said i transitioned into that halfway house three-quarter house and uh, did the requirements i'm one of the guys who did a set of steps in order to prove that they didn't work one of the guys that i met through a hospital and institution speaker meeting so these guys come in from the fellowships and they talk to us about you know the bullshit they went through kind of like what i did here in these last episodes with you and uh the guy who was there and the begin uh, who is doing the H and I is actually my sponsor today, and uh, we have a great relationship. He wasn't my first sponsor, but he's the sponsor that I have today. And uh, I got to that halfway house, 
and life was profoundly different. I got through a lot of my bullshit and trauma and treatment. Then I came to an understanding of acceptance. And when I got to that understanding of acceptance, a lot of things clicked for me. And so here I was in this halfway house getting my life together and uh, it spawned the life that I live today. I don't regret anything from my past, nor do I wish to shut the door on it. But I hope that my experience in active addiction can prepare you for those who are supporting addicts and those who might be addicts to know that there's hope. I'm over four years sober today. I didn't think that out that was ever possible. I can tell you through perseverance, through support, through help, through the meetings, through the things that we use in order to find our daily reprieve from drugs and alcohol, sobriety is totally achievable. It's an achievable goal and it becomes easy. I don't hide from the bars. I go to the bars and I play guitar. You know, if I have a reason and a purpose, I can be there. Would I go to a crack house? Probably not. Actually, for sure I wouldn't. <laughs> it's not healthy for me legally. But does crack and cocaine bother me today? Not even a little bit. Does heroin bother me? Not even a little bit. I don't have to have it in my body. I don't need it in my body. I'm still an addict, 100%. And I can slip. I mean, I know that I have a relapse in me. You know what I know I don't have? I don't have another recovery. I don't have, I don't have another recovery in me. I need to live the one that I'm in. And that's where, that's where it is today. I don't have, I don't have to, to sit back and go, shit, I wonder what a cold beer would be like on a hot day. Fuck that. I, I, I don't even have to be there for that. I am completely free. I don't have to worry about smoking a joint. I don't have to worry about any of that. That's not where my mind is, you know, and it's great living this way. It really is. Jail changed a lot, of, a lot for me. I was standing in the grave when I was in jail and I hopped out and now I can feel the sun on my face. I can feel my mom loves me. My mom knows every day that when she calls me, I'm going to answer the phone and I'm going to answer with, with a clean voice. You know, that's the reprieve. Those are the fruits that my mom is able to gain through the bullshit that I went through. You know, the bullshit that we as addicts all go through. I earned my step one. And that was the last four hours that I spoke about. I earned step one. Do I know that my life is unmanageable when I'm on drugs and alcohol? You fucking betcha. The sober math for me is this. When I drink, when I use drugs and alcohol, it equals me going to jail again and again and again and again. My disease always brings me to either an institution or a jail. And eventually, eventually it's going to become death. I've knocked on death's door many times. I now love my life so much that I no longer am willing to put it on the table like they're fucking poker chips. I no longer play poker with my life. I don't need to do it. It doesn't have to happen. That's just the way it is today. I don't have to do that. And it feels fantastic that I don't have to do that. Later on in other podcasts, I'm going to get into what I actually do today. Uh, I, I do work in the world of recovery, and uh, I do continue a program of recovery, and I try to do my best in living in the solution of sobriety. I hope that this also gives you, like I said, a sense of hope. There is sunlight at the end of this dark, dark tunnel. And for those families who might be listening... Knowing an addict in your life, I mean, addiction is just like cancer. We all know somebody who's fucked up with it. It's just the way it is. But know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. The hardest thing that you're ever going to have to do is you got to send them out adrift. 
so that they can come back. I mean, at the end of my addiction, when I called my mom from jail, the second time I was in jail, I gave my mom a heart attack. Flat out. You know, those are the pressures and the stressors that I put on my family when I'm drinking and using. When I was drinking and using, I thought it was a me problem. Well, I'm only fucking up my life. I'm not hurting anybody else. Yeah, right. Everybody around me was crying just as much as I was crying inside. How selfish am I? My disease makes me selfish, self-centered, and, and inconsiderate of others. Today, it's a totally different story. It's completely different. I, d I don't live that way. I think about other people continuously throughout the day. Hence, why I'm sitting here talking about my story with you. This is my experience of hope, strength, and courage. The repercussions of what could happen from the things that I'm saying no longer qualify. I'm willing and ready to deal with anything. It's just the way it is. Making amends still today, right? I've made the most amends I can make at this moment, and there are still more to come, granted. That'll be all for today. Um, this will be this podcast will be out on the 31st of May, and then the next one will be on the out on the 1st of June. I hope uh, I hope this gives you a sense of hope and a and uh, a willingness to to change. And um, until next time, talk to you then. Bye for now.